All right, so today we have Stefano Cremonesi. Tell us about semi-classics of three angles, two CFTs from holography. Take it away. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Julius, and thanks all for coming today. I know it's uh, the middle of the summer, people are traveling, etc. So nice to see a few known faces and a few unknown faces in the audience. So today I'll talk about uh, uh, this recent paper that I wrote with Luca Maratucci, uh, who is in Padova, and his former student Stefano Lanza, who is now in a postdoc in Utrecht. And for me, it's a bit of a trip uh, uh, you know, down memory lane, reminds me of things I was doing 10 years ago uh, or so, but I'll try to uh, hopefully motivate you to um, you know, follow the talk uh, with me. So I'll start with some introduction and uh, um, Today I will, I will be discussing superconformal uh, field theories uh, and more generally supersymmetric field theories with four supercharges, say uh, plus four conformal supercharges. So you can have in mind uh, as a basic example for dimensional n equal one supersymmetry. But in fact, today I will discuss uh, uh, the three dimensional cousin, which is called n equal to two supersymmetry. And theories with this amount of supercharges typically have a uh, a moduli space of supersymmetric vacua that people in the audience here uh, like to study. And therefore, um, at low energies, uh, uh, because we have all these light fields, uh, all these moduli, there should be an effective field theory that describes uh, low energy dynamics for the moduli. And uh, because of, uh, uh, you know, four supercharges is uh, quite a bit, but uh, not as much, uh, you typically have a control on the F-term sector on the theory. Although in some cases, uh, uh, finding non-perturbative corrections to the term sector is uh, still a challenge and, or even an open problem. Uh, but uh, much less is known about the D-term sector, which is uh, uh, not protected uh, by supersymmetry. Um, and so we can say very little about it. And so what I'll try to do today is uh, address uh, the uh, D-term sector of a class of uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, n equal to two supersymmetric or rather superconformal field theories. But more generally, um, I will try to marry two uh, ideas uh, or developments uh, which have been um, uh, put forward and uh, developed over the last few years. And uh, um, so which a priori look uh, rather uh, unconnected. So the first one uh, is uh, so-called holographic effective field theory, which was developed by uh, Martucci and Zaffaroni in a very nice paper in uh, 2016, which uh, Luca always says that it's probably one of the least cited papers that Alberto has uh, ever written, but I think it's a very nice one. <laughs> so I was happy to give them a citation. And so the idea there is to use, uh, um, to study uh, supersymmetric field theories in their case uh, was for dimensional n equal one superconformal field theory with some, with a holographic dual and use holography to try and understand uh, this effective field theory for the light fields uh, in a systematic way. And as usually the case in holography, uh, in this case, there are many moduli because you, you need many brains uh, in order for the uh, supergravity approximation to hold. Uh, on the other hand, uh, another very nice development with uh, uh, many more papers uh, over the last uh, seven years or so is a study uh, of the large charge sector of uh, uh, quantum field theories and conformal field theories in general, and uh, uh, following uh, very nice work by Hellerman, uh, Orlando Refert, and Watanabe, and then Monin, Pierce, Calava, Ratazzi, and Sebold, and many others who followed, it was understood that uh, essentially inser inserting uh, uh, large charge uh, operators uh, in the path integral uh, forces uh, the saddle point, uh, the leading saddle point to change. And then you can essentially expand uh, about the new uh, leading saddle point. And uh, you can do that in a systematic way um, in uh, inverse powers of the uh, large charge. And you can develop an effective field theory, uh, typically for the number goals on bosons, uh, uh, perhaps uh, with supersymmetry if you're interested. And there is a very nice uh, review that I recommend uh, reading uh, the list down here. Uh, and so in that context, uh, which also applies to theory without supersymmetry, uh, there are a few papers uh, uh, notable by Hellerman uh, and friends, uh, which discuss uh, uh, the large charge sector of uh, supersymmetric field theories. Uh, and uh, there they discuss uh, examples with uh, very few moduli, typically one modulus. So the idea there is that the 
the presence of a modulus complicates uh, the general story. And so they tried to start with a uh, low number of modules. So it seems that the two approaches uh, uh, you know, deal with very different regimes. But what I will try to do today is uh, first to uh, develop this holographic effective field theory for uh, uh, three-dimensional n equal to super conformal field theories with the uh, uh, holographic duals in M theory. These are theories on the world volume uh, of M2 brains, which were studied by Aroni, Berman, Jafferis, and Maldacena some 15 years ago, and many others who followed. And uh, therefore, I will develop this, uh, uh, determine this uh, effective field theory. And then I will try to use it uh, to initiate a study of their large sector uh, by uh, semi-classical analysis. OK, so then uh, uh, depending on who you are in the audience, you might need some motivation. So why do we care about uh, world volume theories on M2 brains uh, with uh, n equal to supersymmetry? Uh, well, probably given the audience, so depending if you're old enough, you were around, uh, uh, you know, after the ABJM revolution, you won't need the uh, motivation. But uh, in general, uh, uh, you could either be interested in them because you want to understand the dynamics of N2 brains, or maybe you're interested in three dimensional uh, uh, field theories, which have uh, all sorts of um, uh, gauge theories in particular, have all sorts of peculiarities. Uh, such as uh, monopole operators, which appear. Uh, and then if you study the theories on uh, M2 brains, it was realized uh, um, at the time that you uh, often have uh, quivers, which also include uh, uh, fundamental flavors. Then you can uh, add uh, fractional M2 brains. You can turn on fluxes. Uh, there are non-perturbative corrections that uh, play a more important role than in four dimensions. So there are lots of things. Uh, uh, which would be nice to understand. And uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, in spite of uh, all the progress which was made uh, up to 10 years ago or so, the general correspondence still not uh, entirely understood, even for toric uh, Calabiao fourfold. Um, part of it uh, is uh, uh, due to the fact that maybe we need uh, non Lagrangian theories uh, uh, to describe uh, the world volume theories on M2 brain sectoric Calabiao fourfolds. But even in Lagrangian cases, uh, uh, often you can argue that uh, non perturbative corrections uh, might play a role. And this might be a reason why uh, some questions remained open at the time. OK, so, but just to keep, uh, uh, you know, there are all sorts of uh, uh, theories which were uh, uh, for uh, uh, M2 brains probing toric Calabiao fourfolds, which were proposed. Uh, or even derived uh, systematically at the time. Uh, but uh, today, you can just keep in mind the simple class uh, uh, of uh, so-called flavor ABGM theories that I work with uh, um, Francesco and uh, Cyril uh, about uh, you know, some 10, 15 years ago. And a simple example, if you consider N M2 brains probing the cone over Sasaki Einstein manifold, which is known as Y12 over P2, certain uh, uh, land space bundle over P2, uh, then uh, the theory is described by uh, the quiver here on the left, uh, which has some uh, two UN uh, gauge groups with some bifundamentals. You will be familiar oops, sorry, with this kind of quiver uh, if you study D brains, uh, D3 brains probably in the conifold. And so there is uh, the typical superpotential that was worked out by Klebanov and Witten. Uh, but then it turns out that there are also Chern Simons levels. Uh, we are in three dimensions. And uh, if you uh, uh, you know, work out uh, this uh, field theory by starting from N theory and reducing to type 2a, you can uh, essentially determine the Chern Simons levels. And you'll also uh, realize that there is a D6 brains, and that leads to fundamental flavors, which are called P and Q, and they're coupled to a bifundamental in this way. So, anyway, this is just to keep uh, something in the back of your mind if you're familiar with these quivers. And typically, back in the day, could Sorry. I ask a question? Please. Yeah. So uh, th is this description of these 3D theories uh, supposed to be thought of as a microscopic description and it flows to? Yes. Yeah, so the best, yeah, the best way to think about it is that as a microscopic description, that would be a Jan Mills Chern Simons theory in the UV, uh, which is uh, weakly coupled and flows to the CFT. Mm -hmm. Uh, at low energies. Although uh, in this case, I mean, you could uh, directly drop uh, the Jan Mills terms and declare that this is a Chern Simons theory with matter. There, is, there are no scales. 
And so you could argue that that directly describes uh, the CFT. Okay, thanks. Um, and okay, so as I said, the, um, the gauge group typically is uh, said to be UN times UN. In this case, if you have an uh, uh, regular M2 brains. Uh, um, but it turns out that because uh, Sasaki Einstein space, this Y12 has a, a two cycle, you can reduce uh, the three form uh, of M theory along the two cycle and you get a vector multiplet, which is called a, a Betty vector multiplet uh, um, in the bulk. And you could, uh, uh, and depending on uh, uh, which boundary conditions you impose for this vector multiplet, uh, uh, structure of the gauge group and the type of global symmetry can change. And so if you impose Dirichlet boundary conditions for this vector multiplet and the gauge group is UN times UN, there is a U1 global symmetry uh, where uh, conserved current uh, is the one that I write here on the right. And if you turn on uh, uh, a background uh, um, value for the real scalar in the uh, associated background vector multiplet, you can turn on an FI parameter uh, equal FI parameter for the two gauge groups in the quiver, uh, which in turn um, is interpreted as a fixer solution parameter in the geometry. So this is what was usually studied uh, back in the day. Uh, but today I'll uh, consider uh, gauging this U1 global symmetry, and then you will have an extra uh, U1 uh, gauge group uh, in the box. So that will correspond to a picking Neumann boundary conditions uh, for the vector multiplet. Uh, um, the Betty vector multiplet in the bulk. And in terms of the quiver, that means that the Faye Leopoulos parameter is now a field and geometrically the resolution modulus is uh, dynamical. Uh, so I should say that back in the day, people would take a slightly different approach to this Neumann boundary condition. So you could integrate out this uh, uh, new vector multiplet and then uh, essentially see that uh, uh, the field strength, uh, which appears here in the right hand side of the current JA, is uh, ungauged. And so the gauge group uh, would be UN cross UN modulo a certain U1, but uh, uh, we find it easier to uh, extend the gauge group uh, in this way and not integrate out the vector multiply. Stefano? Yes. Uh, when you say boundary condition, what is your uh, setting here? So I'm thinking that, yeah, so there is a, I have a vector multiplet in the bulk, say in ADS4, uh, and uh, uh, that could have, a, you could impose a Dirichlet or Neumann boundary conditions, or in fact, I mean, there's a whole SL to Z worth of uh, boundary conditions that you can impose. So this is at the infinity? At infinity, yeah, in, at the boundary of ADS4. Mm -hmm. And there is a nice paper of Witten where he studies this and relates this to the S, uh, to you know, some operation uh, introduced by Kapustin and Strassler to understand mirror symmetry, and which now we simply think of as gauging a zero form symmetry. I see. Okay. Thank you. So, so the field theory, the, these. These two different choices of boundary conditions give rise to two distinct field theories? Two distinct field theories. And in general, I mean, as uh, understood by Witten at the time, there is a, for a three-dimensional uh, uh, field theory with a U1 global symmetry, there is a, well, there is an SL to Z action on uh, uh, three-dimensional field theories with a, a U1 global symmetry that maps uh, uh, different theories to itself. Essentially, the S transformation of SL to Z uh, amounts to gauging the zero form symmetry, and then you gain a, a dual uh, topological or magnetic zero form symmetry. And the T transformation amounts to adding a Chen Simon star. So, in the in the example of the flavored ABJM theory, is this is the Neumann boundary condition corresponding to just gauging that U the U one? Yeah, gauging this U1 global symmetry that I have in the first line, exactly. So simply sort of changing the square to a circle cor corresponds to, is that the? Uh, no, uh, so the square here is, uh, I mean, there is no flavor symmetry in this theory because the flavor symmetry, uh, because it's just one. So this is a uh, really gauging a topological symmetry uh -oh, I see. In, the original, uh, in the original theory. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think in, in n equals four, this will be correct, but in n equals two, you have to be more careful. Is that right? 
uh, I don't see the difference between n equals four and n equal two here. The what you have in mind? Topological symmetry. I mean, you can do it, uh, you know, while preserving uh, the the amount of supersymmetry that you have. So you could do the same in n equals to four. But that would would mean uh, would, would imply what uh, Philip said that uh, the U one becomes slower. So um, I, I think the crucial point here is that you have those additional hours P and Q. And, uh, and and this can only happen in one course two. No, that that's true. But my point is, I'm not gauging this U uh, one flavor symmetry also because it's not a symmetry at all. Okay. So I, I'm gauging a topological symmetry with the current in uh, here in the first line of the table. I see. So it, it's 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 one of those. Things. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, thanks uh, for the questions and please keep them going. Uh, but I should uh, now make an apology and this was the only quiver you'll see in my talk today. So I think I've done <laughs> my bit. Uh, and instead I'll focus on uh, the holographic effective field theory. Well, the main reason is because, uh, you know, there are plenty of works, uh, including several of mine on uh, uh, quivers of that type and uh, moduli space of aqua. Uh, so today I'll try to focus on the holographic effective field theory. I will just mention that even though I will not discuss it today, so the holographic effective field theory will turn out to be a theory, again, with 3D n equal to uh, supersymmetry. Super and essentially uh, all the data of that, uh, as you will see uh, as we go along in the talk, the data of the three-dimensional uh, have a holographic effective field theory comes from uh, geometry. And so uh, essentially by construction, it provi provides a very nice bridge between uh, uh, computations that you could do in the geometry and computations that you could do in the field theory, which back in the day were then compared. And now they are bridged together by this holographic effective field theory. And so in particular, one can match chiral operators in the holographic effective field theory that I'll describe uh, towards the end of the talk and chiral operators in the quiver theory, like the one that I had here. And for instance, I studied in this paper with uh, Nopadola and Alberto a few years ago, uh, rather easily. And you can find details in the paper. I'm happy to discuss it at the end of, uh, of the talk. OK, so uh, what I am plan to do for the rest of the talk uh, is to go through essentially these four parts plus some conclusions. So first, I'll uh, remind you of what these holographic and theory backgrounds uh, are or what they look like. Um, then I'll, uh, try, I'll uh, derive or rather present a holographic effective field theory uh, while neglecting uh, potential non-perturbative effects um, for this class of uh, m theory backgrounds. Uh, once I have this holographic effective field theory, I will use it to, uh, I will use semi-classical analysis in this effective field theory to study their large charge sector. And in particular, I'll focus on chiral operators. And uh, uh, finally, in part four um, of the talk, I'll, uh, we'll see how these uh, chiral operators in the holographic effective field theory have a very nice uh, interpretation in M-theory. Uh, and I'll make some remarks there. And finally, I'll conclude. So are there any questions before I get started? Okay, so um, let me start with the holographic M theory background. So uh, as I said earlier, the setup will be a large number of uh, uh, M2 brains, or so-called regular M2 brains, uh, which are free to move on a resolved Calabial cone that I'll call X, or sometimes X8 uh, to remind ourselves that uh, it is eight real dimensional. So typically, uh, well, for ADS-CFT, one first uh, consider the case in which X is a cone over Sasaki Einstein manifold, and all them two brains uh, are uh, at the apex of a cone. And this corresponds to uh, being at a super conformal vacuum uh, which is essentially the apex uh, of uh, M. M here is the moduli space of vacua of this theory. It's also a cone, it's also a uh, uh, Kähler. And uh, obviously, uh, at the superconformal vacuum, uh, we're uh, 
uh, at the origin of the cone. And the radial direction here will be parameterized by the Goldstone boson of dilatation invariance that I'll call the dilaton, not good to be confused uh, with the dilaton of string theory, and that will appear later on. Okay, so this is what uh, uh, you would uh, normally study first when you do ADS CFT. But um, uh, in order to set up the formalism of this holographic effective filteria, I will need to go to a generic vacuum uh, in this modulized space of vacua. And in particular, geometrically, this will mean that uh, I will have to resolve uh, uh, my Calabiao con X uh, by giving volume to you know, all uh, possible uh, event cycles. And then I will also separate uh, M2 brains. And so I'll have a bunch of moduli. Some of them are uh, the resolution or Keller moduli or uh, parameters, depending on uh, the boundary conditions that you choose. And I'll, I'll call sigma A the real Keller moduli, which are complexified by some axioms. And there will be two uh, of them, where this is the second Betty number. And uh, uh, in addition, I, I can also move all these M2 brains. And so I have extra uh, moduli for N of them. Uh, which tell me where uh, each of the M2 brains is located in this four complex dimensional space. So the holographic effective field theory will be uh, um, an effective field theory for this moduli. Okay, and then uh, the supergravity backgrounds take uh, this standard form uh, of a word product uh, and there will be an, um, a four form flux. I'll have to impose a uh, boundary conditions, and in particular, I'll impose that uh, the asymptotics is uh, uh, ADS four times Y seven, where I'm, uh, uh, you know, very far from uh, all uh, uh, M two brains and far away uh, along the cone. I just see the conical structure. Um, and uh, uh, note, in particular, that the work factor goes to zero far away, rather than going to the constant and to a constant. Uh, uh, this is a result of the near horizon limit, and this will also play a role in the holographic effective field theory. So once you impose these boundary conditions, uh, uh, you know, the warp factor uh, can be uh, uniquely determined because there is a unique asymptotically vanishing Green's function on this uh, asymptotically conical uh, Calabial space that I can uh, use to write the warp factor. And of course, there are many generalizations that you could uh, consider, but today I'll just uh, uh, work with this uh, simple setup with no fractional M2 brains, uh, no internal flux, uh, uh, smooth geometry, etc. Okay, so now uh, I'm afraid I need to introduce some uh, geometric generalities because I'll need them later. And you can tell me if this is too boring, uh, too obvious, or too hard, and I'll uh, adjust accordingly. So uh, I'll need to make a few assumptions on the geometry X, uh, this. Uh, um, resolved Calabiao cone. So first, uh, I'll assume that uh, it's a smooth Crefant resolution of the Calabiao cone. And secondly, uh, I will assume that it has the same topological properties of uh, uh, resolved toric Calabiao four cones. Namely, there are no uh, odd dimensional cycles. There are no complex structure moduli. And then importantly for us, uh, the second Betty number, um, so the number of two cycles, would be equal to the number of six cycles, B6 of X um, along the cone, but then there are also two cycles uh, in the Sasaki Einstein B2 uh, of Y. And so correspondingly, uh, since I will be uh, reducing all sorts of forms, uh, it's, you know, it's useful to introduce some harmonic uh, one comma one forms, which I can take to be integral. And they will split, I will call them generically omega A, but I will split, split them in omega hat alpha, where alpha runs from one to the number of uh, uh, six cycles, and omega tilde sigma, where sigma runs from one uh, to the number of two cycles in the Sasaki Einstein. And you can take a dual uh, perspective and think uh, in terms of uh, divisors. And so there will be compact uh, uh, divisor, there are B6. Uh, uh, of X uh, compact divisor, or there are non-compact divisors which have a boundary uh, on the Sasaki Einstein, which is the boundary of the uh, of the cone, and um, there are B two of Y, you know, of them. And also correspondingly, um, it's good to keep in mind, uh, and this will play a role later in, in a remark, that uh, the um, 
harmonic two forms, uh, which are dual to compact divisors, are uh, um, normalizable. So you can integrate, uh, um, they have finite norm uh, uh, on X. Whereas the ones uh, which are dual to non compact divisors, uh, uh, unsurprisingly, are not normalizable. But uh, thanks to the uh, work factor and with the specific boundary conditions where the work factor goes to zero at infinity, and we have uh, ADS4 asymptotics. Um, it turns out that all these uh, one comma one forms are normalizable if you change the measure by including the, the work factor H. I would call this uh, warped uh, L2 or wall, uh, forms or warped normalizable forms. Okay, and next uh, uh, it will be important to think about uh, the Keller form, uh, which measures how we resolve um, the Calabiao space. Uh, I would call the Keller form JX. Uh, it will be the sum of an exact uh, piece, which is uh, uh, the delta bar of a globally defined potential K0. And then there will be a term which um, keeps track uh, of the uh, resolutions. So um, sigma A here are the real Keller moduli, and omega A are precisely this uh, harmonic uh, one one forms that I introduced in the previous slide. And uh, um, they're close, they're not exact, and so they can be written as a del del bar of some locally defined potential kappa A, which uh, uh, once exponentiated can be thought of as a metric on uh, the line bundle associated to uh, the corresponding divisor dA. And since they're locally defined, they will have uh, transition functions when we move to a different patch, and here's how they transform. Okay, so at this stage, uh, there is a lot of ambiguity um, on the definition of uh, J0, uh, sorry, on uh, K0 uh, and kappa A. And so it's good to get rid of uh, some of that freedom. And we can do that by imposing uh, these conditions here. So the first is a, a condition that relates uh, the derivatives with respect to sigma of uh, K0 and of, uh, kappa A. Uh, not incidentally that this derivative of the kappas with respect to sigma is uh, also globally defined. So all these conditions are globally defined. Uh, then we require those derivatives to go to zero um, uh, symptotically along the cone. And also we require that when it's set to zero, the Keller parameter uh, K0 just becomes um, the Keller potential of the Calabiao cone, which is proportional to the square of the radial coordinate. Okay, so and then uh, having set up all this technology, we can write uh, uh, the Keller form as a delta bar of a Keller potential as usual, Kx, uh, which can be written as uh, K0 plus uh, sigma uh, times a kappa. And uh, um, now the kappas are a partial derivative, thanks to the first condition that I impose, are partial derivative of uh, the Keller potential with respect to the Keller moduli sigma. And I should stress at this point, since uh, Kx, uh, the Keller potential, will appear later on, is that this is not any Keller potential uh, on the Calabio space. It's a Keller potential that satisfies all these conditions. OK, so now, uh, with all those uh, backgrounds and generalities in mind, I can start uh, uh, introducing the uh, idea of holographic effective field theory where we'll build on uh, the work of Martucci and Zaffaroni in uh, type 2b. So the I, idea there is to start from a work compactification. Uh, and you can think of having, say, compact uh, Calabiao. In our case, it uh, would be a Calabiao fourfold, which has a warp throat. And uh, there are a bunch of uh, M2 brains in our case, uh, uh, which are um, distributed uh, along this uh, uh, warp throat. And so you can uh, alternatively think of this as a com uh, as a completion of a, of a warp throat into a compact uh, manifold. Um, so uh, Luca Martucci a few years ago uh, developed uh, um, essentially uh, um, methods to find the uh, effective uh, uh, supergravity for these warp compactifications. And now you can uh, take uh, a rigid limit in which essentially you take the uh, cutoff. Uh, that separates, uh, say, the conical region or the warp throat region and the compact region of the Calabiao. You can send that to infinity. That sends uh, to infinity the three-dimensional uh, Planck mass. And then you'll be left, uh, uh, after you rescale um, 
uh, some of the fields by powers of a uh, Planck mass, a two dimensional Planck mass property, you take the limit and you're left with a three dimensional uh, uh, n equal to uh, theory that just describes the dynamics on, of uh, M2 brains on these resolved cones without gravity. And this is our uh, holographic effective field theory. And it's important to notice here that the resolution moduli here uh, remain dynamical. Uh, um, precisely because their kinetic terms are finite. And it turns out that the kinetic terms for the resolution moduli are, are given by this uh, kinetic matrix, which is precisely what appeared here in this uh, warped uh, uh, inner form. And so uh, by construction now, essentially the, all the resolution moduli will have a finite uh, kinetic term, whether they're associated to, uh, uh, you know, um, compact divisors or non-compact divisors. Okay, and then there is an extra uh, complication that uh, the holographic effective field theory uh, can be formulated in uh, many different ways because uh, they are always free to dualize a, a free uh, chiral multiplet uh, um, with a U1 uh, global symmetry to a dual uh, linear multiplet that contains uh, a conserved current or equivalently an abelian vector multiple. So I'll present a few uh, formulations. You don't need to worry too much about the details, but I'll try to give you the logic and uh, perhaps uh, confusingly, but the reason will become clear in a minute. I'll start from a mixed formulation in which uh, I'll treat the M2 brain moduli uh, whose lowest components are just the positions of the N M2 brains uh, in this uh, four complex dimensional. Calabial space as a chiral multiplets. Uh, but on the other hand, I'll treat the resolution moduli or Keller moduli as a, a linear multiplets or multiplets of uh, conserved currents, uh, which locally can be written as a, a DD bar of an abelian vector multiplet. So you can also alternate think of this as a, an abelian vector multiplet. And just to remind you, the lowest component of sigma which in this case will be the field strength multiplet of the abelian vector multiplet is the real scalar sigma in the vector multiplet. And then at some point you'll see the current, which is a Hodge dual of the field strength. Okay, uh, anyway, then you can uh, um, throw this into the machinery of a holographic effective field theory that I uh, sketched in the previous slide. And you'll find uh, uh, an action uh, for this uh, moduli, the chiral multiplet Z uh, and chiral Z bar and the uh, uh, linear multiplet sigma or um, abelian vector multiplets. And it's given uh, by the integral over all of superspace of a certain potential that uh, come to in, um, in a minute. And of course, you can expand in components here. Uh, I'm writing the bosonic terms in the action. Doesn't matter. Uh, the details don't matter too much. Uh, but I just wrote it to you know to show that one can uh, work out all the details uh, very explicitly, and uh, the first uh, nice observation that you can make here is that uh, uh, when you turn the crank of this holographic effective field theory, you'll find that uh, the potential uh, calligraphic f that determines uh, determines the action is uh, nothing but uh, the sum of the Keller potentials um, of the Calabi-Yau evaluated at the positions of the uh, N M2 brains. And incidentally, this is not, again, any Keller potential, but it's a Keller potential that satisfies these conditions. And so, um, I don't know. So this is uh, a peculiarity of uh, this formulation that we find interesting, uh, that essentially suggests that uh, the holographic effective theory is governed by a, a mean field created by the N M2 brain. So it's a sort of a hard to approximation. And as we see, this is a um, special of this uh, formulation. And finally, uh, I should stress that there is, a, because the M2 brains are all uh, identical, uh, there is a residual uh, uh, gauge symmetry, which is uh, the permutation of the M2 brains that we'll have to uh, uh, take care of. Okay, so this was a mixed formulation. So next, uh, um, you might be interested in a formulation with uh, all chiral uh, superfields. And uh, the way to do it is a uh, standard. You just have to do a Legendre transform. Basically you can trade uh, 
the linear multiplet or the associative vector multiplet for a uh, chiral multiplet by you know, doing a Legendre transform like this. And then the potential that uh, governs the effective field theory in that uh, formalism is now given by the sum over uh, all the M2 brains of the uh, globally defined potential K0, again, evaluated at the positions of um, uh, the M2 brains. And once again, you can uh, expand uh, in components and that will make manifest uh, the complex structure of this um, moduli space of Bakwa, which in particular is a vibration where the base is uh, parameterized by the coordinates of um, the N M2 brains and the fibers are given, are parameterized by this uh, uh, chiral superfields rho A, which are dual to the, uh, which are, you know, the chiral um, incarnation of the Kähler moduli. Um, and one point that I can make already here, but it will apply to essentially all other formulations, except for the one uh, that I presented in the previous slide, is that now the uh, R3 approximation no longer holds. So uh, we can't have a simple uh, interpretation in terms of a mean field. Uh, so here, naively, you would say that um, the potential uh, K that governs the uh, uh, holographic effective field theory is once again the sum of uh, n terms, uh, uh, each of which is uh, the potential k0 evaluated at position of, uh, of one of the m2 brains. But then the key point is that the, the relevant variables here, are, uh, the z's and the dual chiral superfields rho a. So in this expression here, uh, I should uh, express sigma as a function of uh, all the chiral coordinates that I obtained by uh, inverting the duality relation in the first line. So uh, because of this, uh, uh, I can't think of this as a mean field approximation. Okay, uh, and but obviously you might complain that uh, you know uh, I'm free to dualize any subset of the linear multiplets or vector multiplets to chiral multiplets, and that's true. So there is a multitude of uh, uh, formulations of this uh, holographic effective field theory, uh, and now I'll just briefly comment on one formulation that might be. Uh, uh, particularly appealing. And this has to do with the fact that uh, uh, there is an ambiguity in the definition of these uh, harmonic forms. So essentially uh, uh, all the harmonic forms omega tilde, uh, which are dual to non-compact divisors, uh, can undergo a mixing with the uh, harmonic two forms omega hat, which are dual to compact divisors. So the logic here, uh, roughly speaking, is that uh, if you take a non-compact divisor and add that to it a compact divisor, it's still non-compact. And so uh, it turns out that there is this ambiguity, which is reflected in an ambiguity uh, in the definition of the linear multiplets uh, uh, or the chiral multiplets. Uh, but if you look at these uh, uh, ambiguities carefully, you can see that um, uh, there is no ambiguity for the linear multiplets uh, called sigma tilde, which are uh, associated to um, non-compact divisors, and for the chiral multiplets, which I call rho hat, which are associated to compact divisors. Uh, and so you might want to use this uh, particular formulation because uh, there is no uh, ambiguity. And there is a physical reason for this. So the reason is that uh, the sigma tilde are uh, essentially linear multiplets, which are, uh, correspond to the uh, Betti symmetries that I mentioned earlier. Uh, these are U1 symmetries, which are exact uh, in the uh, context of ADS5 CFT4, they would be called non-anomalous baryonic symmetry. So there is a conserved current uh, or supersymmetrically a linear multiplet, which is uh, uh, well-defined, and those are my sigma tilde. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the symmetries that you uh, obtain, uh, say, uh, by reducing the tree form uh, uh, of M theory, uh, along uh, two cycles, uh, which I call the hat. Uh, these are the symmetries that are called uh, dual symmetries in the boundary I'll call E1 alpha. Uh, those are not uh, exact and they're broken by non-perturbative effects. In particular, you can uh, wrap a Euclidean and pi brains on uh, uh, the associated non-compact divisor, and this will generate a, a super potential that will break the uh, shift symmetry associated uh, to this U1 alpha. 
And so then uh, uh, the well single value, you know, the well defined functions uh, uh, variables here are the chiral multiply set up here in the superpotential. Okay, and uh, so very briefly here, I think I'll just uh, mention very quickly this is not that important. Uh, so if the uh, Calabiao geometry is toric, uh, uh, then essentially there is a U1 uh, symmetry for each of the coordinates on the Calabiao. And so you can also dualize uh, uh, M2 brain moduli. So you have, uh, if you just uh, describe the M2 brain moduli as chiral multiplets, that corresponds to the holomorphic uh, presentation of uh, toric geometries. Uh, on the other hand, you can dualize these chiral multiplets to linear multiplets in the same way that it did before, and that uh, will correspond to the symplectic uh, presentation of uh, the toric geometry, where you view the toric geometry as a torus vibration over a compact polytope, which is known as del sound polytope. Okay, this is just a quick comment for the experts. Okay, and uh, finally, uh, I would like to stress that uh, um, if the space, uh, if the internal geometry is toric, then the moduli space is uh, also toric, uh, well, up to this uh, uh, quotient by the permutation group, uh, and also up to non perturbative corrections that we will ignore in the rest of the talk. And so you can use a machinery of uh, toric geometry and uh, results. Uh, uh, of Martelli, Sparks, and Miao uh, to constrain the uh, holographic effective filtering. And in particular, in the purely symplectic formulation, uh, uh, essentially the effective filter will be governed again by some uh, uh, potential which is integrated over uh, all of superspace. And uh, the nice thing about this potential is that it's given by this form here, uh, oops, uh, on the right. Uh, again, the details are not important. So there are essentially three terms which are entirely determined by the toric data and that will define a, a smooth metric on the uh, moduli space. Uh, but then uh, that, uh, that smooth metric is not the one that you uh, get when you consider uh, M2 brains probing uh, Calabiao uh, geometry. And uh, uh, essentially the... Uh, what contains its information is a homogeneous function of the degree one, which is smooth uh, uh, inside each uh, Keller chamber and which also encodes uh, potential phase transitions uh, when the Keller parameter cross uh, uh, walls in Keller moduli space. And uh, you can also be very specific about uh, what the dilatation of uh, generator or the U1 asymmetry generator look like or what uh, the dilaton, the Goldstone boson of uh, uh, of uh, dilatation symmetry uh, looks like. And in particular, notice here that um, that information is controlled by certain real numbers, uh, bi and pa, which uh, control the R charges uh, uh, of operators. They'll enter also in the dilaton and uh, secretly they also enter in this uh, uh, function sp, which we need uh, to construct the potential. Uh, and so all the data uh, of the uh, uh, holographic effective field theory and really the uh, symplectic structure is controlled by these real numbers, bi and pa, which control uh, our charges, and by this uh, homogeneous function of degree one. And I should stress here that the real number bi are really the components uh, of the rib vector, the generator of the U1 asymmetry uh, that you see in the geometry. And so we know how to uh, determine them by volume minimization following Martelli, Sparks, and Yao. Uh, but now there are extra, some extra real number PA, which uh, are um, related to the fact that now we also allow for uh, resolutions of the geometry. And they should also be determined by the Calabiao condition and would be interesting to uh, understand if uh, there is an extremization principle that determines them as well. Okay, finally, I guess I, I'll make a, just a quick comment on the validity of the holographic effective field theory. Uh, obviously, so we're considering two derivative uh, um, effective field theory, so it's only valid for low energies, uh, uh, so energy below uh, essentially the mass of the lightest resonance, which is proposed proportional to the expectation value of the square of the dilaton. And uh, the proportionality factor, uh, 
can be argued to be proportional to an inverse power of uh, n, the number of n2 brains, uh, which we estimated uh, uh, to be uh, three halves, although uh, I think there are a number of assumptions here. So this certainly needs further checks. But the bottom line is that uh, uh, we expect a holographic effectivity theory only to hold for energies much smaller than uh, the web uh, of the dilaton squared. And uh, uh, correspondingly, uh, it will mean that uh, um, it will be, when we look at uh, uh, inserting operators of large charge, uh, the charge uh, should be, the dimension of this operator should be sufficiently high. Uh, is there a question? Yeah. Um, when you have a multi-dimensional Hilbert space, I mean, wouldn't this this bound depend on the direction in Hilbert space that you're? I mean, I meant I'm moduli space. Sorry, the direction in moduli space that you're asking about. Um, yes, uh, I agree with that. But notice that. Uh, so essentially, here the let's look at this formula here for the dilaton. So let's express uh, the linear combination of uh, um, essentially moment map coordinates uh, L i and sigma. Uh, which live in this uh, Delzan polytope, the base of the, um, the vibration. And so different direction will be uh, picking, you know, it's a different direction in the space of Li and sigma. So that will manifest itself uh, in the web of uh, the dilaton. Okay, so so basically here, I mean the fact that the uh, that I, I'm just the, saying that I, I I'm not complaining about that. I'm complaining about this one this one. Uh, yeah, on no, that's I yeah I I agree that I mean that's not really motivated. I think it was just a way of of uh, you know getting a yeah. So we're really hand waving here. So I wouldn't put the, you know too much weight on anything I've written there. I think this needs further thought. Okay, it, it just um, is just an estimate. Sure. Okay, and then uh, the other comment is that since we have this uh, um, uh, permutation symmetry uh, between the M2 brains, we want to stay away from fixed points. So we don't want to have uh, uh, multiple M2 brains uh, uh, stacked together. Otherwise, our uh, holographic effective filter will break down. Uh, although you might hope that. Uh, if the multiple M2 brains are at a smooth point in the geometry, then there is an enhanced supersymmetry that possibly protects you from corrections. And the other comment that uh, I want to make is that, uh, I mean, even uh, when the holographic effective field theory uh, cannot really be trusted in general for the d -term sector, which is really what we determine, uh, the Carroll sector is uh, protected and so we'll be able to make uh, calculations which hold uh, even when this, uh, conditions don't hold. Okay, and I think with this, I'm, uh, I'm done with the holographic effective field theory and next I'll uh, move on to semi-classics. But are there any questions uh, before I do that? Um, well, I had uh, one, which was that you're making this assumption that the sixth Betty number of X vanishes so that you can get rid of the non-perturbative corrections. Yeah. Do you, can you say anything? Uh, general about how strong that assumption is or, or, uh, or yeah so if you for instance if you look at the toric geometries uh, I mean it's it's a rather constraining uh, um, assumption but uh, you know there are infinitely many examples where that holds if you're uh, looking at toric geometries that would be described by some uh, uh, lattice uh, polytope in three dimensions and so that's the statement that there are no uh, internal lattice points. So if you, any polytop without an internal lattice point uh, will, uh, will obey that condition. So you're muted. I, I was asking more if there's sort of a, a, a physical, what this car, an idea of what this corresponds to physically. What, what is it that's allowing you to to um, in from the from a three D field theory point of view, to turn off uh, non perturbative corrections to the super potential. I'm just uh, yeah. So I can say that at least in um, okay. Um, 
So back in the days, you know, 10 days ago or so, I, Cyril and uh, Francesco were uh, in this business of trying to derive uh, the three-dimensional field theory on the world volume of M2 brains by reducing M theory to type 2A and, uh, you know, being careful about what happens uh, uh, in this reduction. And so what I can say is that typically if there are uh, internal, I mean, that, that cannot always be done. And so for that reason, we couldn't describe all toric uh, uh, Calabia of four cons, but uh, when it can be done, then typically what happens is that uh, uh, when you reduce to type 2A, you also have a uh, compact uh, four cycles. Uh, and so you have uh, essentially fractional uh, D2 brains, which can be thought of as D6 brains, wrapping uh, compact for cycle. So then when you see, uh, when you think about uh, the quiver gauge theory, that essentially means that some gauge groups will have a, a rank, different rank from uh, the other gauge groups. So even though you're describing say N M2 brains, uh, if there are, I don't know, say P of uh, this fractional brain, maybe one of the ranks could be N minus P. So that was a specific, uh, so something that you could uh, observe uh, in the quiver. And then uh, uh, in that case, you would typically expect these non-perturbative corrections. And I think it's fair to say that even though I think our derivation at the time was rather solid, there, was, there remained some doubts that uh, what we wrote were enti you know, entirely the correct theories. And I think the reason is uh, that one has to understand these non-perturbative effects. So this is all I can say now. But I should also say that one motivation for us to go into, you know, writing a 100 pages long paper is that uh, eventually we're interested in uh, calculating these non-perturbative corrections and uh, match them between uh, uh, the holographic side and the dual field theory. Okay, so next I get to uh, the connection to semi-classics. So we have this uh, uh, holographic uh, effective field theory that uh, uh, is valid at leading order at large n. And now we'll uh, use a subtle point approximation, this effective field theory to uh, calculate uh, correlation functions of operators with large charge. Uh, so in principle, since we have uh, the D-term sector, we can uh, calculate uh, uh, unprotected correlators, and that would really be the interesting uh, outcome of this analysis. Uh, but today, and in the first paper that we wrote, we'll just focus on uh, essentially the uh, protected uh, correlators, which on the one hand, you might say are not interesting, uh, but as we'll see, we'll be able to understand uh, a number of points there. So uh, I would question whether that's interesting or not. And in particular, uh, the protected sector I'll be uh, discussing is that of uh, chiral operators. So uh, you might uh, think that it's a good idea to start uh, with the formulation of this holographic effective field theory in which uh, uh, all the moduli are chiral operators, which I'll collectively denote as phi. So reminder, there are some M2 brain moduli, sorry, uh, Z and some uh, uh, Keller moduli rho. Uh, and then uh, the effective chiral operators. Uh, so since all these, uh, uh, so the lowest components of these chiral multiplets uh, have an imaginary part, which is periodic with periodicity one, uh, the effective chiral operators are obtained, which are uh, single valued are uh, obtained by exponentiating them and weighting uh, uh, various terms by integer charges. Uh, uh, but then it turns out that if you want this uh, object to be globally defined as uh, should uh, um, as a you know chiral operator in the conformal field theory should be, uh, these charges will have to live in the discretized version of this uh, del Zan polytope that appeared here in the symplectic uh, formulation of uh, the toric geometry. So basically, the the charges are the discrete or the quantized version of the moment map coordinates, which I called L here. Okay, uh, and we'll see in the next slide that, uh, on the other hand, if we trade some uh, some of these chiral uh, uh, moduli for uh, uh, abelian uh, vector multiplets, uh, then uh, the effective chiral operators would be uh, described by a top monopole operator operators. Okay, so I'll start with something very simple, which is uh, try and calculate the web uh, of one of these, uh, well, or any of these. Uh, 
effective chiral operators that I just defined in a generic vacuum where the moduli uh, take the chiral moduli take this web. And obviously, I mean, you're, you're welcome to complain here and tell me, ah, but we already know what the result is going to be. I simply have to plug uh, here the expectation value for the moduli, and that will give me the expectation value for the effective parallel operator. And uh, indeed, that's the result that we're going to get. But as you see, uh, the calculation will teach us something. So uh, first of all, let me uh, explain how uh, one does that by semi-classic. So we're inserting this chiral operator in the path integral. And uh, uh, so essentially we're going to exponentiate uh, that operator and uh, we'll evaluate the path integral by a subtle point expansion of this modified action in the exponent that I obtained after exponentiating uh, the operator. So um, essentially the operator will, uh, the insertion of the operator will back react uh, and change the subtle point. And it turns out that uh, this is uh, done uh, uh, most easily by using the formulation in terms of uh, vector multiplets instead of uh, chiral multiplets, although one can do it both ways. Uh, so if we want to use uh, uh, vector multiplets for the moduli, we have to do this uh, Legendre transform. And now we'll also, because we have uh, boundary conditions uh, uh, at infinity, the fields, uh, the moduli have to go to the web uh, uh, at infinity and also we'll have uh, uh, insertions. It will be important to keep track of boundary terms, but okay, that's a straightforward exercise uh, that you can do. And when you do this uh, exercise, you'll see two things. So first of all, you'll find uh, uh, subtle point uh, equations and BPS equations. So first of all, uh, you find that the insertion of the operator turns on a uh, uh, magnetic uh, monopole for the abelian uh, vector multiplets of charge Q, where Q was uh, precisely the charge here that I had in the uh, exponent. Uh, this by itself is not so surprising whenever you dualize a chiral into a vector multiplet, uh, uh, that's what happens. Uh, and then there is a BPS equation uh, that relates the field strength to the real scalar in the vector multiplet that we can solve to find the BPS subtle. And the BPS saddle consists of two terms. Uh, uh, the first term here um, governs the long, long distance behavior and essentially given by the dual of the boundary condition, which is the web of the scalar. But then at the, uh, close to the insertion point, uh, there is um, the moment map uh, diverges uh, and the divergence is controlled by the charge uh, of the monopole insertion. And okay, once you have this BPS saddle, you can plug it back uh, uh, into the action or the path integral, evaluate it semi-classically, and you'll find uh, uh, the expected result unsurprisingly. And similarly, if you have insertions of multiple uh, uh, chiral operators at different points, they behave uh, uh, as they should uh, uh, you know, for the web of uh, chiral operators. Uh, but uh, uh, already here we learned something interesting. Um, so we have all these charges uh, Q alpha, and in particular we can split the Qs into uh, charges M, which are uh, um, magnetic charges essentially for the uh, M2 brain moduli, and the charges N, uh, which are magnetic charges for the resolution moduli. And so if the magnetic charges for the resolution moduli are non-vanishing, those are the Q alpha here. Uh, what it means is that uh, the um, real Keller moduli sigma will diverge close to the insertion point and the divergence will be controlled by the magnetic charge. And so what this tells us is that inserting uh, uh, such an operator in the path integral will have uh, uh, the effect of dynamically resolving uh, the Calabiao. And I'll get to why that happens uh, in a couple of minutes. Could, could I ask a question? Yes. About the, so you're taking, uh, to, to look at these saddles, you're taking a large charge limit for all of the Q alphas independently? In uh, words, well, I mean, let, right now I'm, uh, I'm really, sorry. Go ahead. No, right sorry. now I'm really ignoring the, you know, that I should take a large charge limit. And I think uh, uh, all we need is uh, the R charge of the operator to be large. 
And so, so some of the some of these charges might vanish. Uh, what, what matters is that our charge of the operator is large. But that said, because the operator here is chiral, uh, we're getting uh, uh, you know the correct uh, and because it's protected, we're getting the correct result even at small charge. Right. I'm I'm just asking about uh, the, the just this just the saddle point approximation. I mean, just formally in the saddle point. Do you need all of the components of Q large or just? No, the... as I said, I think uh, all, all that we need is the R charge of the operator to be large. That's going to be a linear component, linear combination of the of the Qs uh, times. Uh, uh, well, I, I'll get to a formula for that in a second, and I can come back. Okay, and so that was a one point function in a generic vacuum. Another simple cal calculation that you can do is a two point function of that. Uh, insertion of a chiral operator and it's uh, a conjugate in a conformal vacuum. Uh, we essentially preserve a super conformal symmetry or at least a dilatation um, invariant so we can work in a radial quantization. And essentially, this is the type of uh, calculation that uh, uh, Kapustin uh, was doing with his students 20 years ago when he was uh, looking at. Uh, uh, you know, estimating scaling dimension of uh, scaling dimensions of monopole operators. So you just have to uh, insert a magnetic flux on, through the two spheres at the, uh, at infinity at the two endpoints of the uh, of the cylinder. Uh, then essentially you just project to the lowest uh, uh, energy state uh, where the energy is uh, uh, given by the Hamiltonian uh, on the cylinder. So it's the dilatation symmetry. And anyway, it's a standard calculation, and here is the result. So obviously, the two charges, uh, magnetic charges, have to match because df is zero uh, in the bulk of the cylinder. And then the result is given uh, uh, by this formula up here, from which we can uh, read off the dimension of the uh, effective chiral operator, which is given by the inner product of the charges q and the, the b's here collectively. Uh, denote this real number that uh, denote that uh, control the R charges of operators. So, um, and this is an agreement with independent results that we can obtain, uh, you know, from toric geometry and the fact that these uh, are chiral operators. So the dimension is equal to the R charge. So coming back to your question, Philip, I think I mean all we need is that uh, uh, this dimension is large or the R charge is large. So it's a linear combination of uh, of the mag yeah, of the quantized charges, which has to be large. And if that is the case, then we we'll trust the holographic effective field theory. Thanks. Okay, so finally, I guess if I can take a, a few more minutes, I'll just conclude with the interpretation of these chiral operators in M theory, which also I think is uh, uh, interesting. And as usual, uh, because we're dealing with conformal field theories, we can think of uh, operators or states, and I will uh, switch one from one to the other without uh, uh, specifying too much. And um, it's uh, because we're just after uh, the chiral operators, we can just look at the BPS saddles of the uh, holographic effective field theory in a conformal vacuum. And so in particular, let's first start uh, by setting to zero the magnetic, the charges n associated to the uh, resolution parameters. These are the quantized uh, Keller moduli. And so you could start uh, from the BPS saddle, uh, saddles on uh, the Euclidean cylinder. They take this form, the uh, real scalar in the vector multiplet is a constant proportional to the magnetic charge. And then there's uh, uh, the field strength as a magnetic flux uh, through the two sphere. And then we can, uh, uh, say, um, trade uh, the field strength uh, uh, of the vector multiple by uh, a dual photon, which uh, when you follow the duality between chirals uh, uh, and vectors, is just the imaginary part of a, uh, of a chiral multiplet. And we can also uh, Vic rotate to Lorentzian. And when you do that, uh, you see quite easily that essentially the solution describes a now it's a uh, time dependent and uh, the angular coordinates of the M2 brains in this internal manifold uh, 
you know, is uh, increasing linearly in time. And uh, so essentially what we're describing here is a, a M2 brains, uh, which wrap uh, a two sphere uh, inside the static two sphere uh, inside global ABS. And they spin along this uh, internal angular direction in the Sasaki Einstein space. And this is what uh, back in the day people were called dual giant gravitons. So I just want to stress that from, uh, uh, from the BPS saddles, uh, uh, you know, it's very easy to understand it, uh, their interpretations in, uh, in M theory. And similarly, you can now instead turn on uh, the uh, discrete uh, killer parameters, say the charges NA, but turn off the discrete uh, 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 M2 brain moduli, MI. And now uh, it will be convenient for me to work in uh, Euclidean R3. So these are the BPS saddles. And in particular, we have a, a monopoles here inserted at the origin uh, for uh, the vector multiplets, which are associated to the corresponding killer moduli. And because these were coming from the reduction of the four form of M theory along the various two cycles, you can uh, reinterpret this uh, as insertion of a magnetic object for the four form of M theory. And that's a uh, Euclidean M5 brains, which wrap uh, uh, the divisor, uh, which uh, um, is given by essentially linear combination of a uh, basis of divisors where the uh, coefficients are the magnetic charges. And this is uh, this uh, Euclidean M5 brains was also, uh, I guess, back in the day, people would call it baryonic. Uh, uh, M5 brain, uh, because when you switch to Lorentz and you have an M5 brain wrapping uh, a five cycle in the Sasaki Einstein, and the analog of that uh, uh, in uh, type 2b would be uh, D3 brain wrapping uh, uh, a three cycle, and that would uh, um, describe uh, uh, the insertion of a baryonic operator. So uh, anyway, uh, names aside, the key point here is that we're inserting a baryonic, uh, uh, you know, an M5 brain, and it's the back reaction of this uh, M5 brain that dynamically resolves uh, the Calabiao X, uh, as we saw here. Okay, and finally, just some brief comments. So uh, obviously, if you turn on uh, both types of charges, you'll have a bound state of uh, these baryonic M5 brains and dual giant gravitons. Uh, I think I'll skip the remark here, and I'll just uh, uh, want to conclude here by giving a, a few advantages of uh, the formalism that uh, uh, we developed. So back in the day, people uh, typically, you know, when they were studying uh, uh, giant gravitons, dual giant gravitons, uh, 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 baryonic uh, brains, etc. They were typically working in um, in the probe approximation, whereas uh, in our holographic effective field theory, we can uh, uh, keep track uh, of the full back reaction of this object. So that's an advantage of our uh, uh, approach. Another advantage is that, uh, 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 for instance, uh, if you wanted to compute the expectation value of some baryonic uh, operator. Uh, holographically, there was a prescription given by Klebanov and Murugan that told you to consider uh, Euclidean uh, uh, brain uh, uh, wrapping a certain uh, divisor and uh, calculate uh, the action, uh, the onshell action, and that would give you the web of the baryonic operator. And now we see that uh, that prescription really makes sense because, uh, uh, you know, in our, when if we want to calculate the expectation value of that baryonic operator, we just uh, uh, have to consider uh, a certain subtle point that we reinterpret it here as uh, the insertion of a, a M5 brain wrapping a divisor. Uh, another advantage uh, is that uh, when you study uh, giant gravitons, uh, you know, back in the day, 15, 20 years ago, what people would do is again consider probe brains uh, in the geometry, and then you would. Uh, work out their configuration space, uh, which is a symplectic manifold. Uh, so that's all classical analysis. And then you could do geometric quantization uh, of that system uh, to you know, uh, obtain results uh, in the quantum theory, and in particular, discrete spectrum 
and uh, quantize charges. But in our case, that's all automatic because uh, uh, you know, the charges are all quantized because we have, uh, by construction, because we are considering uh, a top monopole operators for a, a you know, compact abelian uh, gauge theory. So all charges are quantized automatically. And something else that comes uh, automatically is that, so back in the day, you had to impose by hand that the number of uh, giant gravitons was less than or equal to the number of uh, uh, M2 brains, and that again now comes uh, by construction. And finally, we can also motivate this orbit average prescription of uh, Komatsu and friends, which is more recent, and that simply comes from uh, the uh, permutation symmetry, which is a gauge symmetry. Okay, so I'll, uh, uh, I'm out of time, so I'll uh, conclude here. I uh, just want to uh, summarize what we've done. So we worked out uh, the holographic effective field theory for M2 brains uh, probing resolved Calabiao 4 cones. So this uh, works at leading order in a large N expansion, and uh, also we neglected so far uh, potential non-perturbative effects. And I hope I've uh, convinced you, at least by when we uh, looked at the same classics, that uh, this formalism, since everything is, uh, um, all the information is encoded in a single effective action, it unifies many aspects of a holographic dictionary single, in a single framework. And so it makes it easier to compare calculation in the geometry and in the dual uh, quantum field theory. And there are many future directions uh, uh, in which you can take this work. So uh, something would be interesting to look at, as I mentioned, is uh, uh, the calculation of uh, unprotected uh, correlation functions uh, uh, at large charge. Uh, it's also, it would be interesting, uh, and that was uh, our original motivation to uh, finally work out the non-perturbative corrections to the moduli space, uh, if there are um, uh, exceptional divisors in the geometry, then you could uh, generalize in many ways. So for instance, you could consider internal fluxes, et cetera. And now, given the audience, uh, I'll add maybe a couple of uh, more comments. So. Uh, as I told you, essentially the effective chiral operators in this holographic effective field theory, at least if we formulate it here in terms of vector multipeds, are uh, a top monopole operators. And so it would be interesting to um, essentially uh, reframe uh, the calculation, uh, the geometric calculation of uh, Hilbert series or baryonic generating functions in terms of monopole counting in this holographic effective field theory. Another aspect that needs to be understood is the uh, uh, extremization principle of Martelli, Sparks, and Yao, which uh, uh, you know, worked uh, in the absence of resolution parameter. There must be an extension of that uh, uh, you know, to work out uh, all the charges that I call here. Sorry. All these uh, real numbers, bi, but also the new real numbers, PA that control the R charges of the operators once you allow for resolutions. And uh, finally, you might be interested in four dimensional physics. So uh, there's more that can be done there following the work of Martucci and Zaffaroni. And the last comment that I want to make is that even though uh, this holographic effective field theory is typically phrased in terms of holography, if you uh, like to do geometric engineering, you could use the same. Uh, uh, ideas to construct an effective uh, field theory for your geometric uh, engineering. And with this, I'll stop and thank you for your attention. All right, let's thank Stefano. Thank you. Do we have questions? So, in the, the very last point you mentioned with the geometric engineering, what would what, 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 what would be the idea here? So, well, yeah, let me go back to, sorry, my laptop is uh, slow at responding. I'm trying to go to yeah, wait. a previous slide, but it's not. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna describe <laughs> it in words. So um, okay. the idea there is that the, you would get the, the way you got this holographic effective field theory was uh, uh, to start from uh, uh, the effective uh, supergravity theory for warp compactification and then take this mm -hmm. compactification limit or rigid limit. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, okay, we're also interesting because interested 
because of holographin having M2 brains in the cone. And uh, we were imposing uh, boundary conditions which were appropriate for holography. But you can do the same without uh, the M2 brains if you want, and you can okay. impose uh, you know, uh, asymptotically conical boundary conditions or whatever boundary conditions are uh, appropriate to your problem. And so for instance, if you wanted to describe, I don't know, some other class of three-dimensional N equal to supersymmetric field theories by geometric engineering, you could just uh, use a Calabiao for con, or obviously you can, you know, change uh, the dimension of the internal space and supersymmetry, and so that will give you, yeah, some effective action for that theory. Hi, I thought when whenever you talk about large charge, there could be a possibility of black holes. So, any relation to black hole physics? Um, yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good point. Yeah, we haven't really thought about this, but that's definitely something that, uh, uh, yeah, it's worth studying. Uh, there is also, I guess, a related question there is, is that you might wonder whether, for instance, quantities like, uh, protected quantities like uh, superconformal indices or maybe limits uh, of indices, which are, uh, you know, important to, uh, for microstate countings uh, could also be um, obtained from this holographic effective field theory. So that's an open question, but yeah, thanks for the remark. That's definitely another potentially interesting uh, future direction, but I don't have anything to say right now. Um, it, uh... Can you apply all this the, the same framework to to theories with uh, with more supersymmetry you know, n equals three n equals four in three d or or does it somehow go no on? yeah yes yes you could um, w wouldn't that be a, a, presumably then you're looking at simpler objects than resolve Calabiao four cones or something. <laughs> yeah, know. so for n equal three, you would have a tri Sasakian, I mean, cones over tri Sasakian manifolds, or yeah, n equal four would be hyperkähler, etc. So mm -hmm. the geometry would be more constrained. I'm just uh, wondering whether it, do you think that that would, I mean, you can still ask the, the same sort of interesting questions about on, you know, leading correct. Leading yes. Correct classics for unprotected correlators in those cases and so forth. Yeah, indeed, uh, that's true. I mean, our motivation to start from 3D and N equal two was that, uh, you know, at least for me, it was that back in the day that, I mean, that's the largest, um, that's the amount of supersymmetry for which uh, we had the you know, largest class of uh, uh, dual uh, uh, holographic duals, uh, which are known, but at the same time, there were also still open problems. They were hoping to address, but uh, yeah, one could definitely. There is definitely more that can be said uh, uh, with higher amount of supersymmetry, and yeah, possibly, especially for the study of uh, uh, correlation functions. That that's probably a good suggestion. Uh, Stefano, uh, related co to continue this line. Um... There are two uh, nilpotent orbits of uh, complex dimension four, the minimal nilpotent orbit of uh, SL3 and the uh, minimal nilpotent orbit of uh, C2. And uh, so for the case of C2, there's been a collection of studies related to that. But uh, as far, I cannot recall, maybe there exists, but I didn't see studies of um, minimal SL3. So this could be a good uh, starting point to check what's going on in such cases. It's, it's not toric, but uh, yeah. it has this symmetry. Uh -huh. It has both the SU2R and the uh, SU3 symmetry. So the, this, these are nice. So yeah. you know, as a challenge problem, maybe. Uh, that's a, yeah, that's an interesting suggestion. So you, and, and you know what is the uh, relevant field theory on uh, M2 brain? Yeah, 
That's a good question. I'm not, I, I don't know at the moment, uh, ah. but it could be a nice challenge to try to figure this out. Uh -huh. Because it's not towing, uh, it could be an issue. But uh, yeah, anyway, from, from uh, the point of view of a holographic effective filter, we don't need to know uh, yeah, uh, a microscopic description of the of the field theory. We just uh, we just need information about the geometry. I see. Mm -hmm. Ah, and the geometry is known because you have the only method to construct the metric. Uh huh. Um, so that that that's also nice. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Okay, more questions for Stefano. If not, I'd say let's thank him again. And I'll stop the recording.